Welcome, everybody, and thanks for deciding to spend the next little bit with Imperfect Heroes podcast. And before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that we are off and running with Rumble and with YouTube. So now you don't have to just listen to the podcast. You can see all our beautification and (laughs) our craziness. Um, And so if you go to YouTube, it's going to be Little Hearts Academy. If you go to Rumble, it is Imperfect Heroes. And so I'd love to see you there. And if you have comments or ideas or thoughts, we'd love to see that in the chat. And please click the follow and uh, feel free to leave a rating and review. That always helps us to reach more families and broaden our horizons. So today we are talking um, about a topic that really I was so important to me and my family as we grew up and there were seven kids, five boys. So sports everywhere, you know, um, very involved. We had a kids youth thing every Thursday afternoon after school. So you can imagine my family was very busy and yet we still found time. We ate dinner together. That was just how it worked. And um, so my beautiful guest here today is Lynn Bowman. And I have her book, I actually purchased it. And so it is an amazing book. It's called Brownies for Breakfast. Lynn, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? And uh, we'll move on. Well, I, I should start by saying that the brownies are great for you. So don't worry. Uh, it, the, the subtitle of the book is a cookbook for diabetics and the people who love them. But you know, once I got rolling with a book, I realized that it's the way everybody needs to eat now. Um, I would love to see everybody eating like a diabetic because all that means is whole food, real food, mm-hmm. plant-based food, uh, no junk, no crap, uh, and no sugar. Because it turns out that diabetics aren't the only ones who are severely impacted, damaged by eating sugar. And I, I just saw a statistic And I don't know if it's the last year or two up to date, but it's fairly recent. And that is that 60% of the calories that kids are eating in the United States come from soda. Wow, that's interesting. Let that sink in. Um, So that's that's become kind of my mission is, is to teach just the basics of, you know, not every cell and every biomedical thing that, but here's the stuff we all need to be doing. And it's simple, you know, it's, it's yeah. not complicated. Uh, and it doesn't mean giving up the stuff you love to eat. It means discovering some great new stuff as you already have, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, when I got this, I was really excited and I started reading and looking at um, some of the, uh, it's not just recipes, is some great information about nutrition and whole foods and all of that. Um, and so I thought, oh, I'm going to try these brownies. And so I did. And there's, there's no white flour. There's no flour in it at all. Um, no. You've got pumpkin and um, almond butter and eggs and all of these good things. And my husband was very, you know, Meh, this can't be good. Right. So what do I say in the book though? What did I say? I said, don't tell him before. Yeah. Taste it. (laughs) Well, he shops with me. So he had to see all the stuff. Yeah. We always go together. And um, so anyway, he gave it a try and yeah, it's really good. It's lovely. And so I've got grandkids coming next week. And so we're making the cowgirl caviar and we're going to make the granola together as well and have some fun with the grandkids. And and have something healthy for them to have while they're here. So it's going to be just um, a lot of fun. But And then in speaking about food and good food and and um, how to get that, Lynn and I were uh, talking, gosh, this has been about a week or so ago, and uh, we were just talking about how we don't sit down to dinner anymore. Um, or if we do, it's very unorganized and very, and it's not conducive to those 
great and important conversations that need to take place that took place, you know, as I was growing up and as I was raising my kids, um, we sat down to dinner together most of the time, once in a while, of course, you know, it doesn't work out, but most of the time we were together. And so uh, we were just kind of talking about what are the um, ramifications of us not sitting down as a family and eating together anymore. And I, I like to shorten that. Although you, I laugh because you and I were talking and talking and talking. Yeah, we did. We kept going. <laughs> I do a lot more talking, but um, it's it's what is the real cost of fast food? Uh, yeah. And I I think we don't realize what we're giving up when we give up the table and sitting at the table. And mm -hmm. I mean, because I love the title, Imperfect Heroes. If there's one thing to learn when you become a parent, it's to give up the word perfect. Perfect doesn't have anything to do with anything after you have a baby in your arms. Uh, and, and the more you have, <laughs> the more imperfect it gets. True. Wonderful, but not anybody's idea of perfect. But what, what you learn at the table in my book is the most important thing to send your kids away with. You know, when, when that time comes, 16, 17, 18, and they're applying for colleges or deciding to go into this or whatever, whatever they're deciding to do, do you really want to send them away not knowing how to be at a table with other people, how to right. use utensils? how to have a conversation with anyone, how to argue your point, mm -hmm. how, to, how to present yourself, how to use what's on the table, how to share for the little ones, you know, how to, mm -hmm. how to ask for them, all that basic stuff. And yet we are sending kids into the service, into college, into jobs, not many of them. And I mean, I wouldn't have believed this, but it's true never having used utensils to eat. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. because they've eaten, they've grown up eating out of a bag, drinking soda. And, and the other thing, because our young ones now are even more conscious than we were or are in many cases of the environment and, and how we're leaving things. And so every time you eat a meal or a fragment. And I'm trying to think of you with your seven, imagine sending <laughs> seven kids off to have fast food and, and, and yeah. the amount of garbage that is produced yeah. from that, the plastic waste, the nonsense that comes right. from that kind of an eating style, you know, the, the uh, nobody loved a fast meal more than me. And I know this probably <laughs> you because you don't, have time to waste on anything yeah. but no. time at the table is i want to argue maybe the most important time you spend with your kids i mean and we we also love that one-to-one -one time in the car when you just mm -hmm. get to have side by side and you get to have that real conversation with maybe that one kid and on the rare occasions when you've only got one kid in the car so valuable so yes, we have to be in the car with our kids and that's not right. wasted. It's okay. But I'm arguing that you need to find some kind of a balance of what's important and what's not. And mm -hmm. now we're doing their choir and, and language lessons and music lessons. And mm -hmm. we have so many friends where it's all about baseball or all about yeah. football, kind of in the idea. Yeah, basketball, track. Right. All those but, things, cheerleading. <laughs> right. Uh, in the idea that there are going to be scholarships maybe at the other end of this and, you know, maybe a pro, uh, you know, and I, I want to submit that I think we need to be realistic about what the kids learn from these experiences. And I, for one, am not convinced that the baseball field is the ultimate education. Yeah. I mean, I I would argue that there's some stuff they're learning on the baseball field that I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and too with all the boys, I mean, my brothers, all they they played 
little league football. They played little league basketball. I ran there. They actually had a little league track and, and um, in Los Angeles, it was the golden bears was like the little league, everything, anything you wanted came under our area, golden bears. And I ran track. I was a cheerleader, you know, and, and yet even with all that with seven kids, we still ate at the table almost you every night. Your parents valued that and they knew they yeah. were bringing kids up well as a result. And so well, I think too, with values. seven, it became too expensive really, you know, to go out. And, um, and my mom was a great cook and loved to cook. And so maybe that was all part of it too. But, um, there was such a huge value in the conversations and in learning. We just had some friends over and I had a dessert fork, you know, at the top. They're like, why is that fork on top? I'm like, oh, you always want to look for that fork on top because it's a good sign you're going to get dessert. <laughs> and they, they were just surprised. Oh, now I know what that means. Uh, I think you know, a lot of people ask me where my confidence came from. Mm hmm. Which, you know, makes you kind of go, what do you mean, my con what, what are you talking about? But to me, equipping a kid with that kind of information yeah. goes a long way towards sending them into the world. Yeah. Uh, they're, not, they're not terrorized by an invitation to dinner at the, you know, house of the provost or or, you know, whatever comes their way, the, mm -hmm. the office mess. I mean, you know, it can be a wide range of things and, and you can always fit in to a simpler way of dining and life and so on. And that's okay. Sure. But the vocabulary, your kids need to know. And a lot of it is, is just about respect, courtesy. Yeah. Um, which we were talking earlier, maybe the world could use a little more of. They could use a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, I'd vote for that. And courtesy from the tiny ones. I mean, I was just online with my grandson, 20 months old, this morning, and watching him have his breakfast and go through with his mom, my daughter, mm -hmm. Learning, you know, when you say please, you must say please, and you must say thank you, and mm -hmm. you must that you know the, the, these and and the kids. It's you're not being um, neglectful or abusive when you insist at your table on respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's all, I always thought it was engaging when you would find um, often it was families of color or from the South that knew to say, yes, ma'am, no, sir. And right. speak in respect. We had some neighbors back when my kids were growing up and they lived next door and, um, they, they were African-American, but also from the South and their mom would get on them like nothing too just adorable boys. They were overplaying all the time, but if they, if she heard them call me DJ or, or even Mrs. Stutz, it was like, no, no, you say, yes, ma'am, please, ma'am. Yeah. Like yeah. she was really on them about that. And, and of I course, think we're so much more conscious, particularly families of color that the, the, the price they felt they were paying and did pay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for being um, thought disrespectful in any way mm -hmm. was hard. so I can see that that yeah. would even more important uh yeah. with the little ones but it it's true i think for everyone um it never never hurts to be the person who is respectful right. and we were talking earlier about dressing and, yeah. and there's when you because you have to teach your children how to present themselves to the world and a, mm -hmm. a thing and you're often saying to young ones when because I've done some workshops and stuff with local kids. And what I've said to them is you dress the way you want to be treated. And I, I found that often got a really puzzle. It's like, what? Yeah. The you're dressing to let other people know mm -hmm. who you are and how yeah. you want to be 
treated, which yeah. also signals to the people that you want to give and get respect. Right. Well, and, and two, I th I've been in a situation where I've been on hiring committees for the schools I worked at, or I was an administrator. And so I was hiring, you know, um, on different levels. And it was always amazing to me how you could really tell who was taking it seriously when they came in, you know, they were dressed the part, they, you could tell that they were using, um, you know, manners <laughs> And, and then there's people uh, like would just come in and slouch. Like we, we were hiring for a teacher one time and this guy came in, in, in shorts and uh, like a, yeah, like the cargo kind of short things. And, and thought that was a good idea because I don't know, <laughs> but he didn't get the job. you know. And so, and, and oftentimes, you know, may, cause it's such a female um, dominated profession that when guys come in, they have a step up because, you know, we're always looking to have, you know, a few guys on the staff and whatever, but this guy, you could just tell, and he didn't sit up at all. And he kind of slouched. And, and so when we're not teaching our kids how to be successful in a conversation, or if someone disagrees with me, I have to ban you. I can't talk to you because you disagree with me when those are the most important people to talk to. I want to hear how you got to the conclusion that you got to. I'm not threatened at all by your disagreement. Most of my friends disagree with me and I want it that way because I want and to be challenged. You learn at the table at home. Yes. You yes. learn how to disagree in a civil and productive way. And if I'm afraid that if you don't learn it at home, at mm -hmm. the table, mm -hmm. we will teach you where, where then do you learn that? And if you haven't learned it by the time you leave the nest and let's just say 18, uh, you're going to be in trouble because mm -hmm. that's what goes wrong. Uh, yeah. People who don't understand that you can hold different ideas, different beliefs, and still be loving and respectful and learn from each other and uh, be productive together. So, and that, and if that is not the main thing, <laughs> what is, I mean, exactly. isn't that kind of the most important thing of all? Yeah. Um, it's more important than how you handle a wrench or how you, you know, paint paintings or, how you program computers. If you can't, if you don't have that most basic people skill, which yeah. you and I are agreeing, <laughs> it's you learn that at the table with people. Right. Right. Um, and yes, you learn it going out to restaurants too. You learn it watching the way your parents mm -hmm. with um, people in restaurants, the people who help them, the, the waiters and so on. You, yeah. you, which is another thing, DJ, that I'm sure you've gone over many, many times with parents. It's not what you say, it's, it's what you what do. You do. Mm -hmm. And never take their beady little eyeballs off of you ever. So you can't ever let up being the example mm -hmm. for what you want your kids to become. That's the hard part, isn't it? Is yeah. uh, talk about imperfect. You know, that's that's the most seeking of perfection that I would recommend to parents is just, golly, be as wonderful as you can possibly be, mm -hmm. even when the stuff is hitting the floor and the stuff is boiling over on the stove and the stuff and you're late. If you can demonstrate what you mm -hmm. want your children to be able to do, that's yeah. that's your job right there. That's it. Right. Right. Well, and I think there's a trend too. I've noticed a lot of times that, you know, you have a little kid and they're done eating and they just get up and leave and you're missing out on so much conversation opportunities. And, and so if your kid wants to go, that's a sign that you're not engaging them Yes. in yeah. the conversation and wanting to participate. So and there, there are some little tricks that you can use. Like um, I, there was a author, gosh, 
it's probably 20 years ago, I heard him speak, Leo Biscaldi, and he talked about love and reaching out in love and, and that, but he said one of the things that he learned from his parents and they were immigrants from Italy and his mom really struggled with learning the language and all of that, but they had a rule that when you came to the table at night, you had to share one new thing that you learned that day something you didn't know before. And they learned very quickly that he said there were times when, you know, mom's got it on the table. Like, Oh, I don't know what I'm going to tell dad. Cause dad was, you know, they were very Italian and dad was the one and they'd be out looking at (laughs) the encyclopedias. Right. And okay, wait, look at, okay. The uh, population of Nepal is, you know, (laughs) and so then they'd be at the table and Papa would come and say, Leo, you know, what did you learn new today? And well, yeah. the population of Nepal is da da da. And he yeah. sit and think for a minute. He goes, imagine that that <laughs> many people in Nepal. And but it started. It had conversation, and it would lead them. Or I've seen families that would say, give us one uh, happy thing that happened today, and one hard thing, or mm. Yeah. Tell me about someone who helped you today and someone you helped today. And think about everything you're teaching doing that. Yes. It's not the fact of the matter. It's organizing the thoughts, presenting your being uh, brief enough with your presentation, engaging yeah. people, about all that stuff, which is what a career is made exactly. of. Exactly. Really. Um, exactly. And and happily, those kids would leave their family table having taken internalized all that. It, you would never mm-hmm. have to remind them what that means. It, it, this is not uh, as sweeping, I thought, but at my table growing up, uh, well, two things. One, my mother was an English major. She was a, a graduate oh. student in English when she married my dad. And uh, so... She was brutal when it came to, if you used a word incorrectly Mm -hmm. um, or made some other error with your language, you had to go and get the dictionary and bring it back and I kid you not. Yeah. And read and spell. And so, but we, so then we all learned from that. And of course it was kind of fun too. You know, we would end up laughing about it, but we grew up with good language skills as a result. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and I'm not I don't regret that for a minute. But the thing I didn't even appreciate DJ until much later in my life yeah. was the fact that my dad. You were saying that Leo, kept, you know, in those days in the fifties, dad was you know the head of the table, and mm-hmm. he would his briefcase and everyone you know uh, get and he had his place at the table. At our house, my dad was a marketing consultant. Mm. And so he would hold forth. I didn't realize that I was getting a graduate degree in business and marketing at my dining table. Yeah. Uh, It it didn't even occur to me that other people didn't know about ROI. (laughs) You know, they didn't know about industrial marketing techniques that really work. I didn't even know I knew, but I did. (laughs) Yeah, and, and so I I keenly appreciate, and that really that came in very handy for me, uh, having been the sole source of income for my three little ones, um, and having to make big girl money uh, at some point, which yeah happened to too. But I credit my dad to a great extent for that. Uh, my yeah. mom for making me a writer who spelled things correctly. And uh, my dad for giving me this background in marketing and love for it. You know, it was, Mm -hmm. it was interesting and fun and a challenge. And uh, he he was passionate about it. Mm -hmm. So I became the same way. That was all learned at the dinner table before we even talk about food. Right. Yeah. But what I'm fond of saying is food is not just food. Food is love and sacrament and communication and and uh, all these things that you learn at the table 
when you're sharing your food and yeah. and sometimes you're talking about it but sometimes you're just eating but all of the ritual that comes with food whether you're an italian family or an african american family or um native american family or and we in california are so rich in having all these cultures yeah. brought together and a lot of the book is sort of fusion in fact the recipe that you mentioned cowgirl caviar came from one of the ladies who helped me test recipes and um, she is uh, from hispanic uh, family and uh so I benefited from her thoughts and a couple of additions from her, including that one, uh, because we we are accustomed now to um, that. Um, what is it now that it's there's a pejorative that it's called? It's uh, borrowing from other cultures in a. Oh in a, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it they're saying? It's um creation or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and that's one thing that I think too. Uh, appropriation that's it cultural appropriation and that it's a wonderful thing to appropriate things from another culture <laughs> thai food mexican food uh absolutely all fabulous yes yeah and we yeah. have gained so much by being able to to have access to so many of right. these cuisines and borrowing the best and and taking the best of it mm -hmm. and in kitchens absolutely yeah you know, I'm not doing well, that and too there's there's so much we our children can learn about faith at the table they yes. we can have conversations about politics at the table with our uh, kids depends on who's at the table though let's face well, it. well if it's you you're the parent and these are the kids you know okay but i'm talking about if you have uncle ernie over for some reason oh yeah yeah oh well, then that's just fun to kind of make them crazy but <laughs> My, I, our big one was Uncle Verge, and um, yeah, you know what and, I'm talking about. yeah, yeah, but but it was fun watching him. Like he had such very, I mean, I'm fairly conservative in my, it, but he made me look like you know a far lefty because right. he was, you know, and he's past God rest his soul. But um, he 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 was just fun to watch. He'd get animated, and none of us felt. I mean, he was the uncle that you know. You kind of watched out because he's the kind that would grab you and be a little rough. Everyone has that uncle um, and you love them. I, we, we loved him to death. Um, and so, but he would be very animated and we just kind of sit back and watch the show, you know, it was my mom's brother. But I think too, as a teacher, I could see kids who were learning about politics even from their family, where I don't know if it was at the table or whatever, but you would hear them bring up comments about, you know, oh, they hated this president or, you know, or hated the police. They were afraid of the police and, and, or um, just, the, just various social ideas that would come along and here they're five years old. They're not coming to these conclusions on their own, but yeah. these are things that they've heard at home and so it's just really interesting that there's so much to pass on. There's so much to converse and include and, and, and to talk about and to share about experiences and have the kids share their experiences. And, and it, I think and, it's. Go and on. a thing I am all about, as you know, health habits. Yes, absolutely. It's yeah why it matters what we eat in so many ways. Uh, and these days, especially, I would think you would not be able to sit down with food and not somehow refer to, well, Uncle Verge is um, celiac, so no gluten for him. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, whatever is going on. And I, I, I love the idea that kids are so much more conscious now, and I want to encourage that about mm. where, food comes from what is this food we're eating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago that it was definitely all food that was raised by uncle verge and right and dad yeah uh, but now the situation is so different where we've been eating blind 
literally. Yeah. And we've been eating corporate. And, yeah. and here's where I will sound political, but but it's not. It's just the truth of the matter is that most of us are eating to make guys in New Jersey wealthy. We are not eating to make our bodies stronger and healthier. Um, and, and so that is a revolution. I think that's, I just, I hear a lot of good, hopeful things coming from the youngest ones, my own yeah. kids, grandkids and their friends being conscious of food because mm -hmm. also now you can't, you can't take on the health of the earth as an issue and global warming and all of mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And not understand the role that raising food and right. buying plays. So, and then when you buy food, when you source food at a grocery store, it becomes very political very fast. Is this oh. store a monopoly? Who are you buying from? And why Why mm -hmm. did you see this display in the front of the store and then want to grab it? Do you, mm -hmm. you know, my kids and I, I mean, obviously this is a passion of mine, uh, but my kids spent a lot of time. I mean, we shopped together a lot because I was a single mom and there was yeah. no, we were right. in the store. And I am not afraid to say sometimes it was at the discount canned goods store at 10 o'clock at night. You've been there ladies. Yep. You know, what I'm talking about. yep. Um, so we talked about it a lot and yeah. I did not know then what I know now about the food industry, big food. Uh, and I hope that all of you listening are talking about it with your kids and yeah. at the table, like we've been saying, but in the car, wherever, it's essential that we take ownership of our food waste. You know, we've just kind of given it away. Well, we'll grab a this and we'll take some of that. And, the, and then, and you also notice now, because I've suggested it, when you go to the grocery store, when you walk in, there's all kinds of grab and go food in mm -hmm. the front door, right, right by the registers. Right. That's where the money is. There's the bakery, the booze, and the grab and go. Mm -hmm. And that's all right. And they hope they're going to get you. You're going to run in. You're going to grab something from the bakery or the, the deli. And you're going to grab some grab and go in plastic, and then you're out the door. And they've made an enormous amount of profit on those items. And of course, you also have created a lot of trash in those items. I just right. used to, the plastic. Yep. But you have not any idea what you're eating. You don't yeah. know what's in the things. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's the problem. It's funny because. Um, if anyone's been listening long, um, you know that I've recently, yeah. hmm? and we hope you have, and we hope you have, and if you haven't stay with us, <laughs> but so I just recently moved from, I'm, I'm a city girl, you know, Los Angeles, Salt Lake, uh, Las Vegas, Denver. And now I'm in this little town of about 255 people. And uh, we're 20 miles from the nearest, you know, bigger town that actually has a Walmart. And so, you know, but I had uh, just yesterday, some of the ladies around said, oh, new lady, let's go to lunch. And so there were five of us, we all went to lunch together. And it was interesting, because I was asking about farmers markets and all of that. And they said, it's too early. Things aren't in season because they're growing everything. They're growing the potatoes here and corn and, you know, there's cattle and meat all around. And they were talking yesterday about how they're um, introducing things into the meat. Now the MRNA into our meat and the uh, antibiotics and all of these other things. And they said, why would you have them buy that from the store? Like we have, and I'm like, well, so who do I find out about <laughs> buying meat that's here? Yeah. And not buying it from the store. And they were giving me names and, and they'll yeah. butcher a, a cow and they'll post it on Facebook and you can go. And, and I'm like, holy moly. But it's interesting that even out here in Podunk, you know, Idaho, that they are very aware of 
all of the treatments. Though that you know, mm-hmm. it's in, it's like mine and yours, where I I drive into town. It's about four miles, and I drive by the cattle that will be mm-hmm. served up, um, and I almost can call them by name. But that this is we can subscribe to the CSAs, the Community Service Agriculture. Uh, and and love doing that because then we're getting the food that was grown right here. Yeah, and it's one, and we have a little farmers market in town, but not all year round because it's yeah. Rubbed. And a, a thing that you also learn when you really start paying close attention to what you're eating is that there is a huge value in eating in season. Fruits, for example. If you are eating local fruit, in-season fruit, or at least fruit from nearby, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. you are you are eating a much higher quality fruit, yeah, totally different nutrition profile than a fruit that got shipped from Chile or some mm-hmm. other Mexico or whatever. Right, you're so right. You're so right, and I think with that then comes with having a garden if you can. And um, I was just watching a show. I, I, it was either HGTV or Magnolia, one of those. And they were, that's this lady and she helps people who live in the city in small, you know, properties, or even maybe they just have a balcony to have a garden. You can do so much yeah. pots. Absolutely. And it's fun. Yeah. Went back to children at the table. People have so often over the years asked me, well, how do you get, you, how do you get kids to eat vegetables? Easy. It is. Kids will eat what kids grow Mm -hmm. and kids will eat what kids cook. Yeah. And guess what? Then you've got kids who, as you sit around your dinner table at night, have helped you set the table, cook the food, grow the food. And by golly, nobody leaves until they've cleaned up. And then what you've done is you've raised a child who can go and spend a night at anybody's house. And they're the kid that the mom goes, oh, little Johnny is the most, you know, he he was so great and polite and he <laughs> did dishes. And so that's yes. the kid that you want to raise right there. That's it. That's it. Um, well, Lynn, it's been so much fun talking to you. And I know, and it's just us, we don't have time constraints. We, we've got, we went for almost two hours the other day. Just Uh-oh. having fun. Yeah, it was great, though. It was wonderful. Um, awesome. But I'd, I'd like for you to kind of let people know, uh, how do they get a hold of you? How do they find out more about your book and and the services and stuff that you provide? Um, easy. It's lynnbowman.com. Just be sure to spell it. It's L-Y-N-N-E-B-O-W-M-A-N.com. It's not the most glamorous website you've ever seen because we... <laughs> Themselves, but it, there are connections on there to go to the Instagram and the YouTube and all the other stuff that I have out there and to buy the book. Um, I am in the process of recording an audible book. And for anybody who goes, wait, it's a cookbook and there's going to be an audible <laughs> cookbook. I know, I know. But the idea is you can listen and th- about half the book or a third anyway of the book is stories and conversation. Mm-hmm. You can listen to it and I talk the recipes to not all of the intricacies, but just a basic idea of what we're talking about. And then you have downloaded it for only $9.99. You can get an ebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get the, the paperback. The hardback is going to become very expensive, unfortunately. And mm-hmm. it's yeah. it out for a lot of people, myself included. But um, you can get an ebook that has all the recipes in it. And then you can put that thing up in your kitchen on your iPad or your mm-hmm. phone or whatever. And you've got the recipes. But meanwhile, I've been in your ear as you drove along. So that's the whole idea. I'm, I'll mm-hmm. have the book out very soon. Yeah. I don't know when this show is coming well, out. And I want to show too that, I mean, there are stories and it's like, why it's a swell idea to cook and eat this way, whether you're diabetic or not. I mean, there's commentary, there are stories, there's, it's not just a bunch, uh, there's some great recipes in here. I'm not going to 
you know, put any of that down at all. I mean, smoothies and summer squash casserole and popcorn of the gods. I've got to try that one. But there's, like I said, there's so much more of how to approach food and, and uh, it's, it's just fantastic. And so I love that. Is in, in the book for things to watch and listen to, you know, to get more information um, mm-hmm. about if you're more interested and, and I hope you will. Um, and they're big pictures of everything. Yeah. And may I say, not a single food stylist was harmed in the making of this. <laughs> it was all the photographs were taken by me on my stupid little iPhone because I wanted you to know that your stuff was going to turn out just like my stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yes, I like to stick a flower on a thing or, you know, maybe cut it nice, but, but it's, I don't think it's fair to put out a cookbook that nobody can actually make the thing that looks like that gorgeous thing that you make. Yeah. So, yeah. So real pictures of real food. I love it. I love it. All right. So Lynn, I always end with the same question. I ask all my guests and that is, we, you know, we know that there's no perfect parent, hence the title of our podcast, but how would you describe maybe a successful parent? Um, you know, that that's such a tricky question these days. <laughs> it I, is. I'm fond of saying to people that I am delighted that it's not always been true, but Right now, at least, all of my children are speaking to me voluntarily, happily speaking to me. <laughs> and you parents know what I'm talking about, especially mm-hmm. their adult mine are all in their late 40s or mid to mm-hmm. late. 40s. So opinions have been expressed, let's say, um, throughout that. But the other thing is that I have no felons in the group, which... <laughs> Um, and again, you know, and I spent the, the day yesterday in the uh, county uh, seat of uh, Redwood City at, at the Board of Supervisors meeting. And, you know, I, I, sh- I don't mean to be glib about it, because when you face legal problems with your kids, it's mm-hmm. it's and my first husband spent time behind bars and which is another we'll do that later but um you know i don't want to make light of other people's problems with the law it can be horrible Mm -hmm. but so far that's a thing with my children i haven't had to deal with and i'm grateful because that and ill health are two things that just spin out really easily Mm -hmm. so i'm wishing that for other people and if you've had the difficulty. I hope you got some good help. Agreed. Agreed. Lynn, thanks so much for spending this time with us. And, um, and so for a reminder for everyone who's watching or listening, be sure to tell a friend about us and let's expand our family. You can always uh, catch me on Facebook and Instagram and on both of those sites. If you just find little hearts Academy or imperfect heroes, I've got pages for each of those. And so it's easy to get a hold of us and, and be part of the community and share your stories and, and your questions and all of that. We're just having such a good time. And uh, I really appreciate you, Lynn, taking the time from, I know you're busy and, and so sharing all of this great information. I love that we're virtual grandmas. Don't you love that? Isn't it? I, oh, Everybody's grandma. I love it. Yes. That. Yes. I don't know how my grandparents did it because we didn't live by them, but they were still very involved in our lives. But yeah, I'm so grateful for that technology. So an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you later, guys. <laughs>